Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to join us for this amazing event. I was laughing when I walked in. I told some of the team and the senior in the back, I was like, it's not church. Everyone is still sitting in the back. Like, it's not church. But I hope that you feel um, comfortable enough to participate in a very important conversation today for Women's History Month. This is extremely important as we celebrate women, but not just women, as we celebrate the leadership and those that support women in their accomplishments. So it is wonderful to see a diverse group of Airmen, capital A, in the audience today. Um, and I am really excited for us to have the opportunity to hear from our phenomenal panelists um, um, as they share their leadership um, and their life experiences with us today. So again, thank you so much for joining us today on behalf of Colonel Thompson, who would love to be here, but she's currently TDY. We're excited to have you, and we're excited to celebrate and kick off our Women's History Month panel. Okay, thank you. Ma'am, over to you. Thanks, Chief. All right, good afternoon. I'm Wendy Squasha. I'm commander of the 170th Group, Nebraska Air National Guard. I'm super excited to be here today um, to moderate this panel. Um, each March, we celebrate Women's History Month as a celebration of women's contributions to history, culture, and society, and have been doing so since 1981. The intent was to celebrate and recognize specific achievements women have made over the course of history in a variety of fields. This year's theme, Celebrating Women Who Tell Our Stories, acknowledges the pioneering women, both past and present, as important contributors to the achievement of the military services and civilian workforce. The accomplishments of women in the Department of Defense and their contributions to national security help maximize our warfighting capability. We are starting to see more women in key leadership positions and other positions of influence. We're very, very lucky to have our talented panel members here today to talk to us and represent all of us. I'll do a quick introduction of each one of them. And then when, they, when you start asking your questions, please feel free to elaborate on anything that I say. Dr. Brittany Walter is a forensic anthropologist at the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency here at Offutt Air Force Base. She leads archaeological recovery missions around the world and analyzes skeletal remains to aid in the identification of unknown service members. Senior Master Sergeant Yaelene Neely Volsey currently serves as a senior enlisted leader for the Healthcare Operations Squadron. She leads 156 military and civilian healthcare professionals across 12 clinics who provide healthcare for 44,000 beneficiaries. Master Sergeant Julie Lance is the Squadron Aviation Resource Management Flight Chief of the 1st Airborne Command Control Squadron and the Functional Manager for the 1 Charlie 0X2s for Air Force Global Strike Command. That is a mouthful. <laughs> she manages two operating locations with over 300 air crew members' flight training, hours, and data dealing with their aviation career as well as directly supervising seven personnel. So welcome. So how this will work today is um, you're here to ask questions so that we can hear their stories. So if someone would like to kick it off, we have um, what are, ah, microphones um, that we can pass around so that each one of you can ask your question. And if you don't kick it off with a question, I'm going to. So, and then we have uh, the microphones up here. And again, please elaborate on anything about yourselves that I haven't touched on. So questions, who's gonna start? Great, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Matt Sergeant Uggen. I'm with the 55th Healthcare Operations Squadron. And my question to the panel, anyone, why do you um, believe it's important to continue the mentorship of women and girls? Okay. Um, so I think it's very important to continue the mentorship of women and girls, mainly because um, I think we represent maybe 12% of the Air Force around uh, globally. Um, so even when we are in these quote unquote male dominated areas, um, we still exist, we're still there. Um, and it's difficult to navigate through those waters and to thrive through those waters. Um, and, and I think it helps 
to have someone else understand the struggles that you face, um, whether it's motherhood, whether it's just being a woman serving in, the, in this uniform, um, deploying and facing uh, the certain difficulties that we face, it's, it's um, no easy feat. And so sharing that kinship with someone, uh, I think helps when, when they're going through different uh, struggles. Thank you. Um, when I had asked, they asked, said, what is your reason for wanting to volunteer to do on the panel? It was just that I like to encourage women and motivate them and help us to see that we could probably be where we didn't think we could be. And at those positions, like Senior was saying, try to be up there. It's mostly, I see a lot of men in the, in the military, so I understand. And it can be hard, especially with females that, I'll say personality, timid, shy, a little more reserved. Um, so I just really liked for seeing that for the experience that I went through to see like, oh, I can impart this wisdom or let me share this information and from the youngest airman all the way up because I had to learn a lot of things from being the shy little airman to now being able to, okay, put yourself out there. We can do this and we have each other's back and we can encourage each other. So that's one of the reasons I do. Um, I am a first generation college student coming from low income household. And so it was really important for me to have women mentor me. I didn't have a good mentor until graduate school. And so it's really intimidating when you see where you wanna be and you don't know how to get there. So actually having those women, you get to see that it's possible, number one, which is really important. You get to see people like you. And then number two, they're there to support you and to get you there as well. So it, it is just so important for, for women to, to mentor young girls, especially when, you know, if they're in a competitive field or, or something like that, or a male-dominated space. That's a great question. All right, where is that microphone? I, I can go without a mic. OK. Uh, so uh, <coughs> actually, you wouldn't use the mic for the cameras, oh, please. OK. Hey, yeah. All right, so um, following on that question then, uh, what would you say are some stories of mentorship that stuck with you that you got along the way? Oh, I have to think. Um, well, I'm, see, I'm a civilian, so um, I'm going to talk about science a lot. And if you guys want to hear about science, I can tell you all about science. But going to conferences with these women, actually going out into the field, um, archaeology is really male dominant. Um, anthropology isn't so much. There's actually, it's, it's mostly women. If you come to our laboratory, it's almost all women. There's like two men who are scientists. It's great. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's just nice to see is what I'm saying. It's different. Um, but actually taking me out into the field, um, giving me support outside of academia as well, or you know, class, um, going out for a beer and hearing about you know, stories in the field, what to watch out for. Um, also, I actually deploy with active military. So I will lead a team out in the jungles of Vietnam to go dig up a helicopter from the Vietnam War. And I'm doing that with mostly men. And so that can be a little intimidating, one as a female, two as a civilian. And so to actually talk to these other women who are going out and doing this as well, it's really important. Because um, I assume deploying might be similar in, in how the environment is different. And so actually being able to talk to these women, frankly, is, is really important. Um, my first six and a half years was spent on the flight line. I was an uh, aircraft structural maintenance technician. Um, and so I was one of maybe two or three women in a shop of 50, 60 men. And typically, there was um, one of two places that, you know, historically you, you would find a female, and that was um, in the CTK, basically uh, in the tool section, passing out tools, or in an orderly room, um, a CSS, right? Um, so processing paperwork. Um, and then it was, and you're, we'll give you six months, and we'll be pregnant. I'm sure you'll be pregnant, and again, off of the line. Right, And so um, I didn't see a lot of camaraderie amongst the women who were on the flight line, which kind of struck me as odd. Um, sometimes uh, we can get a little catty, right? And we like to um, uh, 
get territorial. Um, and so it wasn't until I was a senior airman in, um, in Osan, Korea, and I saw my, the first high ranking, which was a senior master sergeant, flight chief, um, come in, and I was like, whoa, not only can we do it, not only can we like make it, but we can actually um, get to these levels, right? Um, and my first question to her was, how do I raise in the ranks without being a B? And she looked at me, okay, I was a senior airman, right? But, you know, and she was like, I, I don't need you to be a B, I need you to be competent. And I need you to be confident. And I need you to know what you're talking about. I need you to know how to do your job. Now, if somebody takes that as you being a B, right? Then that's on them. Now, you don't have to be disrespectful. You don't have to, you know, raise your voice and do all of these things, right? You don't have to come with all of that extra stuff. But as long as you know how to do your job, then you'll be fine, right? And don't kind of get confused and, and um, uh, distracted by all of that extra stuff. And then you know what? When you find a, a, a fellow female on the flight line, embrace her, bring her along, right? Take her for that beer and share those experiences that, again, we many of us share. And so that was the best advice that she could have given me. Focus on your competence and your confidence. So there are many experiences. Um, I will say starting off when I see that what helped me is someone pouring into me. Like she said, they encourage, they just help give me the information. And then I started observing, I started watching. Like she says, there are a lot of sometimes some females that can be catty in the military. Um, but that's military building, it breeds compet competition, or you know, we have to compete to get up there, but in a healthy way. So I've always been a girl's girl, so I always look for the females to be like, because I'm comfortable with talking with them. I'm used to, I grew up with a lot of Hispanic families where cousins, my cousins, the females, were like my sisters, my friends, my best friends. So I was comfortable talking with the women. So seeing getting together with them on deployments, um, hearing some of their experiences, honestly, it would have been kind of rough um, because there are some things that they put themselves out there that they, sh they just got themselves into some trouble. So being able to help and encourage them and seeing what resources that they can go through and help and support one another through it, that's been really an interesting experience for me to be able to just keep wanting to help and share with all those. But also there's a chief, this one chief, she just showed like, like she says, show that competence and confidence, but stay humble, truly stay humble. And then one thing as I learned from my experiences of just keep going up in the ranks as I'm, I work with a lot of air crew members. So there's a lot of like, I've been in the fighter world and I've been in the heavies world. So I've seen those fighter pilots, they're like type A alphas, they're alpha males, so they're like, dominant and taking care of business, which is fine and I don't mind it because then it's like, okay, let me take care of my business and you prove yourself and you show yourself by your competence, by what you're taking care of business. Um, so being able to see a little bit of that and seeing how you can get heard by creating your facts, showing what it is that you need, your people, taking care of your people and explaining that to the higher ups and when you have good leadership, they're gonna see that and they're going to um, take you into consideration. They know your things because you, you're, you're credible. So that's some really good experiences that I know that I've seen throughout my career. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Captain Stephanie Taylor from the 55th OSS. Uh, motherhood has come up a couple of times in some of your answers. I am currently 19 weeks along with my first child and I believe there are a few other women here that are expecting as well. Uh, my question for the panel is, do you have any experience or advice for women maintaining and also, or maintaining a active career as well as growing their family? Um, yes, excellent question. Um, balance isn't always 50-50, is what is the best thing that I can, I know. I know. And not only that, mommy guilt is a very real thing. Um, and so I would say communication is probably the best thing that you can do is communicate with your partner, communicate with um, your child, um, communicate with your subordinates, with your supervisors, and figure out what your um, boundary is, right? And try as much as you can, boundaries, um, 
to, to exert your own discipline, right? Your self-imposed boundary, try not to cross that as much as possible um, because this uniform demands a lot from us. And we've learned that from basic training, service before, uh, service before self has been pounded into our minds. Um, but then again, that responsibility to that child is another thing that's pulling at you. The responsibility to your airmen is pulling to your work. And so just trying to figure out um, where you can kind of draw that line and where sometimes you might have to blur that line for the moment, cross over, and then come back, right, um, to find your middle ground. Um, it, it's the best thing that I can say, right? And just give yourself some grace, um, give your leaders some grace, and just really over communicate with what you need and have them reciprocate, right? What do they need from you? And figure out what is um, actually an attainable expe expectation, right? What can you do? What can you deliver? And what are you just not going to be able to do? Yes. Um, number one is possible, 100%. Um, my daughter is going to be one years old next month, so. It's still, I'm still trying to figure out, it is not 50-50. And I really like the way you put it, that you know, blurring the line for now to reach priorities, goals, things like that. Um, another, I guess, piece of advice I can offer as a new mom is to communicate. Oh, you already said that. But so postpartum was, was really difficult for me. And it's difficult for a lot of women. Really, really difficult. And it wasn't until I got back to work and I was talking to my supervisor about some struggles I was having that she told me she had the exact same struggles. And to be able, if I would have known that earlier, that would have helped me while I was in the thick of it. So if you can reach out to any new mom, any moms and just, sometimes you just have to let it out and they, hopefully they will support you and they will tell you it's you know just a moment in time and, and you'll get through it. So if postpartum, I mean, it's gonna be rough at some point whether you like it or not, but just like you said, give yourself some grace and um, make sure that you're talking with other women around you who are mothers. So you're gonna hear from a perspective of someone who does not have children. But I've worked with women, just as I have, I'm a coworker right now, she's pregnant. But just as they're saying it's true, that communication, I truly believe that majority of us are wanting to hear to help each other. But she, care, she takes care of business. I know she isn't taking advantage of it. Um, I see her hard work and I can see where I'm like, man, we can accommodate and work on this to be able to help her on that. Only because she has been open and communicating with me. And I do have grace for that, and I understand, because I think you moms that are military are super moms, seriously. Because I always thought, oh, I'll wait till once I retire, then I'll have children. I don't know what I was thinking, because my body's too tired. I'm <laughs> exhausted. And I'm like, nope, I think my husband and I are okay, okay without kiddos for now. Um, so that's why you moms are amazing. It is a big challenge, I do see that. But there can be definitely grace, but I also know that, like she says, the military is demanding. So utilize the resources that are there. I love Airmen and Family Readiness Center. When I did a special duty there, I saw all the, um, you get free childcare for PCSing into a place and even like, leaving a place. And I didn't even know that was available for uh, family members that have children. Also, you get a first time basics, a first time moms. There's so many resources that the military provides that as hopefully supervisors, because I see a lot of, I love that there's uh, males here at this event too, you can help encourage them to say, hey, go to family advocacy, and they have new parent support systems, so that way you do have these new mothers that are coming in and trying to figure out that new transition, because it is challenging having a child and then still having the military and figuring that out and not get that mommy guilt. So just know that there's a lot of resources, definitely share, talk, and. Yes, that's exciting, sorry. Oh, am I on here? Yeah, that communication piece is critical. I just had a conversation recently with an airman. Um, <clears throat> some of the topics that come up can be intimidating or uncomfortable um, to talk about, but it's, it's important that we keep talking about those things and not just, if we call them female issues, right? Not just, it doesn't necessarily have to be a female that we talk to. There's men here in the audience. Um, men have spouses, men have children. Um, so there, there's, um, we just have to keep that communication going so that those um, issues or stories, um, we can help each other. But I have a 15 year old going on 16 and um, I've been in for 21 years. So yes, you can do it. Your balance will change and it will ebb and flow for sure.
Congratulations. To you. Yes, congratulations. Yes. I had one more thing also, is also try to find a way to fit time in for you yeah. to take care of yourself. Because a lot of times we're so busy pouring into every single person and you know every job, whether it's at home, at work, that um, we give so much of ourselves and just very little for our, you know, or so much for everyone else and so, so little for ourselves. And then, you know, a year is, comes around a lot faster than you would think. And then here comes that year mark, and here comes that daunting PT test, right? And it's just, so just try to find time to fill, you know, get yourself back into, into a comfortable space, is what I would say, yep. Awesome, who's next? Staff Sergeant Gorilli, 55th Healthcare Operations Squadron. So this is a difficult question and something that I've dealt with personally. Do you think for uh, mill-to-mill spouses um, that each member is treated equally when it comes to their children? And how would you face this obstacle going forward? Uh, so, okay. Um, <laughs> So I don't think, I think the expectation is that the mother stays home with the child who's sick, right? That's like usually the experience that we um, face. Um, and the, the struggle with that, right, is that you have um, the, the, the husband, the spouse, right, who um, wants to uh, take some time away, but their leadership is making it extremely difficult. Meanwhile, you have the um, mom and her leadership who's like, hey, I have responsibilities too and I have obligations too, right? And so it's uh, you know, difficult because we serve in our own right um, until that comes, right? And everyone's uh, mission is very important and we have to be able to execute. But um, again, that guilt comes in and uh, the communication has to happen, right? Whether it's, and it's difficult, right? Because so I waited until I was further along in my Career before I had um, my one kid because I waited so long, um, and so both my spouse and I were higher up in in our, our you know in ranks. Now the the guilt is self-imposed, and the urge to stay at work is self-imposed, um, and it's a, okay, I need you to stay this time, well, now I need you to stay, well, I have this really important meeting, I can't get away, well, me too, right? And so uh, then it's like, oh, can I just give her some Tylenol? <laughs> She'll be fine, um, right? Uh, so communication, is it fair? No, it is not because a lot of the, uh, our male counterparts have civilian spouses who can have the luxury, but not all, right? No. So, would you like to hear? Uh, no, yeah, no? Great. I have nothing okay. to contribute. <laughs> yeah. I just wanna make sure I understand your question. So is it like males, females, how, the, how she says the moms will stay home more, that is, and how to make that equal in the military, you're saying? Hmm, that's a good question. I think the military is trying and keeping in consideration because even when I hear the dads, um, like, because I work with a lot of men too, and I've heard their side where it's like the dads get forgotten sometimes. They don't get that time off like moms do, or they don't get looked after like moms do. Um, I think military is trying to. I've seen that they up the maternity, paternal leave that they give now, also for the males, thankfully. So that way, dads have equal time with the baby too, and growing and bonding on that. Um, but that's a good question. Yeah, that's something maybe to try to look into everything. Because honestly, I don't know too much on how what the males get and don't get. But you're right. I do hear a lot more for the females than for the males. Yeah, hmm. I, it's it's a culture shift too, right? It, it, it's just a mind shift because they, they get the same time now, right? And so of course the first thing is like, what? Why do you need a whole 12 weeks, 18 weeks, 16 weeks? What is it now? 20 weeks. But what? You didn't push nothing. You didn't. You didn't get cut. Nothing. You know. And, and, but the, the the goal is right, so that you can bond with with the kiddo, right? And this is like okay, bonding with the Xbox, right? Is is what is what people would think, right? And so once again, that's a culture shift. Is what we have to you know change our minds to to allow right for a dad to take. I'm not gonna say take more of an active role, I just said it out loud, but 
to allow that to exist in our own minds. And as a young supervisor, tech sergeant supervisor, when I would have um, male airmen um, and COs who had um, appointments for their kiddos, and maybe they had some issues going on with that with said kid, and there were multiple appointments, I too would say like, well, where's his wife? Why can't the wife take him, right? And it's a maturity thing that comes along with that as well, right? Because there's not an appointment that I'm okay with dad missing, right? Both parents have to be there so that we're both on the same page. But as a young supervisor, I was not of that mind, so. Sergeant Yonner, 55th H Cos. Who is your favorite historical female figure and why? Ooh, I like that. Well, my favorite historical female figure goes by the name of Madeline Millette. She birthed me, so. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, she is. And, that, and she's historical to me. She paved the way. She was the first female in our family to join the Army. She retired Army. So she um, paved the way for both my sister and I, uh, my cousins. It's, it opened up a whole new world for us, you know? Um, she, has, she showed us how to serve. Um, with pride and with grace and elegance all at the same time. Um, it's not something that uh, my dad was able to do because you know he's not a woman and he was actually the first person to say when I would go to him for advice, you know, ask your mom. Your mom is really, really good at navigating those waters and massaging um, certain things. And so for me, yeah, that's, that, that's her mommy. She, she held it down. Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, so a little bit about myself, so I grew up Catholic, so I got a lot of information about Mother Teresa. I'm not gonna lie, she is always someone that I really looked up to and because of her faith, faith is a very big important thing that's helped me kept strong going. And she was a hard woman, but humble, and she had a heart for people, like the less fortunate and just pouring and helping. Um, so I really liked that about her, but what I loved is that she was gonna stick to what her goals were to lead the church at one point, saying, um, pretty much saying, if the church isn't going to allow me to do this ministry and go out in this mission that I want to do in this field, then I don't need to be part of this organization and she's going to start up her thing. So she had guts and she was bold, um, but she was humble. So I like that. There's a, there's a good balance that I felt that I am, yeah, that I could respect on that. So the first person I thought of, um, and this is true, so Mildred Trotter, nobody knows who that is, it's not my mom. Um, Mildred Trotter is the first forensic anthropologist and she worked for the DOD, um, whatever it was back then. Um, but she started making identifications during World War II. And so as a female anthropologist, when there were mostly males, she was also making identification of service members. Um, I found out that she existed in middle school when I started really getting into science and things like that, and I decided I wanted to be a forensic anthropologist. And um, ever since then, I've always had a picture of old Mildred up on my desk or you know wherever I do my work, and I just kind of always looked up to her. We look up to her at the lab too, um, because she really paved the way for, for females in and, and STEM, and just specifically in, in anthropology. I'm not going to answer that question, but <laughs> who's next? All right, I'm Sergeant Volsi over at the CPTS. Uh, Senior Neely Volsi, I've been fact checking you back here quite a bit. Um, but so, have you ever experienced or seen uh, a male subordinate maybe not extend a certain level of courtesy or respect towards a female leader? How did you or someone else handle it? from your perspective? I feel like you have to at Milan. Do you have one? Let So seeing something like a male disrespecting a female, that's what you're saying, sir? Subordinate. A subordinate? Because 
my personality, they know I'm gonna probably say something, so people try to like be crossing their T's, dotting their I's a little bit when I'm around, not to be in a bad way, but they know that it's like, hey, we, we follow, we don't, we're against sexual harassment and all this, you know, they know, they see what I, I'm enforcing the core values, or the values of the Air Force, so I have, can't say that there's anything on top of my head that comes off like that, because I would say something if there was something blatant, obviously, right there, even if it's a higher ranking. Um, if it was something some, I wasn't comfortable in that situation, I probably definitely would check, I would probably do one-on-one -on -one with that higher ranking individual and try to assess and figure out what was their, their motive or, I'm sure you probably have a specific thing in mind, but I mean, if it was blatant obvious, like sexual harassment happening in front of my eyes, it's like, no, 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 no. Or like, hey, what's going on? Just like, is everything okay, sir? What, what's happening? But if it's something that's under, like underlying low key, then I'm like, and I'm not quite sure, but I can see that it's uncomfortable. I would definitely talk with the woman or the person one-on-one, -on -one, the airman, and then I would probably definitely find out further what exactly was the higher ranking going about it. So I don't want to misunderstand, and I want them to understand and see that how it could have came off. So, Has there been anything that has happened to you directly when you were maybe younger that were even come across as joking that maybe wasn't so funny? Hmm, it's challenging. I'm just okay, aircrew world, maintenance world, security forces. <laughs> I'm grateful for deployments. I love them. They're, deployments are fun, but I knew I had to be wise in how I carry myself and who I surround and keep myself in that environment. Um, no one's came at me like that, but I never tried to keep myself in a way. Um, I tried to check my surroundings. I kind of knew. I could see, don't get me wrong, you hear those people that will throw those little comments and slide things. And I wish I can always say that I probably stood up for every single place, but there's a culture sometimes in certain places that I knew that there was a healthy joking, and then there are some times where I'm just like, man, that just doesn't sit right, and I'll voice to who I can. Um, so one specific time, I'll say like on a deployment, but it's been years ago. Yes, I never had access to that skiff back there, but I knew that they had all kinds of crazy things posted. That was their morale thing, I think they had said. Mm -hmm. It was their morale of showing videos, showing females naked, and just all kinds of things that I'm like, that's just not the route I go. And a lot of people tend to know that. And I, like I said, I think because they know where, where I stand, what I, what I keep myself and what I don't like, or they'll see that I'm uncomfortable with it, I don't see that a whole lot happening somewhat to me. But if it does happen to others, then that's when I just be like, hey, that's not okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so, um, definitely when I worked on the flight line, so did I see males being inappropriate around females? Was it subordinate towards, an in, uh, towards a leader? Is that, was that the question before? Okay. Subordinate towards a leader. Correct. Male subordinate female leader. Correct. Okay. I have to change my story. All right. So, in that case, the only time I saw something like that was I was a career advisor in Ramstein and we had a younger airman. Um, and we had uh, FTEC and COICs, we had two, one female, one male. And for this particular airman, it seemed like for the male su uh, supervisor or FTEC and COIC, he would you know, straighten up, he would you know, speak appropriately with him. And then whenever he was being addressed by the female um, NCYC, then it, all of a sudden, all of that military bearing kind of fell to the wayside, and it was like, whoa, 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 I need you to tighten it back up. You're still speaking to an NCO. Um, and so we brought that to his attention after we kind of noticed it. We only had them for about a week, but by day two, it's usually you can pick up on some of those cues. That's the closest thing that I saw as far as a subordinate disrespecting a, um, a leader. Now, as a subordinate, being disrespected by a leader, or you know, in that place, like, have I ever felt sexually harassed or anything like that? And I don't know. If now, I'm morphing your question, yes, I have felt that, and it was not. It was the most uncomfortable situation I'd ever been in, as a flight chief, um, who was getting mentorship from my um, chief, um, and you know, because of his. Uh, affection. Uh, I had a lot of mentorship, direct mentorship from him. Um, and when there was enough 
familiarity that was established. That's where bounds started getting crossed. And I started feeling very uncomfortable in that situation. And any time I walked in the office to discuss, it uh, didn't matter if it was Manning, awards, different things like that, um, he'd find a reason to close the door. And I could just feel the heat rising up my neck and turning red. And you know, that was uh, probably the worst uh, experience I ever felt. Way worse than being on the flight line and hearing inappropriate things, even directed towards me. That was the, that was, I felt so violated without even being touched because as a military member, like how could you make me feel this way? And as my leader, the person who I trusted, that is the worst thing that I'd ever, I think he grazed my hand and I was like, oh, that was the worst. And I called you crying, so you know. <laughs> so I'm gonna morph your question too because I heard it how you heard it. <laughs> um, my last deployment in Vietnam, there were a lot of women on my team for once, which was really awesome, and they were younger women, which was even more awesome. Um, but they kind of, I don't know, they looked to me for like, kept asking me questions and mentorship and things like that, and it was, it was a really cool experience, but our, um, so the way a team works is, you know, we'll go out to wherever we need to go to dig up whatever we need to dig up, um, and there'll be, leadership will comprise of me, and I will kind of, lead what happens scientifically, make sure the integrity of the site is good. Um, the team leader, who's an officer, will get us there and kind of take care of everything. And then there's you know, the team sergeant, who kind of keeps everyone in line, make sure everything's good to go. Our team sergeant was the worst. Um, he, uh, he actually ended up harassing a lot of the women on our team, these young women. and. I saw it happening, and I saw them not doing anything about it, and I did not let that go. Um, I went to the DPAA, DDO, I went to the debt in Vietnam, and I was like, this is not okay. Um, and for a civilian to do that, they don't, in the past, they haven't listened as much as they should, um, but it's changing now, which I think is really good. Um, because when you're out there in the middle of nowhere, you need to trust your leadership and you shouldn't be worried about things making you feel uncomfortable. You shouldn't worry about them coming up to your tent and shaking it in the middle of the night. You shouldn't worry about them drinking too much and puking on themselves, right? You should be able to have confidence in them, especially as a young woman, that you're safe where you are in the middle of nowhere in Vietnam. Um, and so I thought it was really important. I supported those women. And um, I got the support of the agency as well, and things happened. And so sometimes if you see really bad things happening, it's important that you go and you talk to those subordinates or those, those younger women and let them know that you see them and that you want to support them. Support is huge. Thank you. That was an awesome answer. I just want to share because that reminded me of something. Um, so if something does happen to women or you feel something, as supervisors, please be open that your airmen can come to you or even a coworker, women or male, either one. Um, and there are ways, because there was an experience I just remembered when you said something about that. In the dorms, there was a dorm manager, and he was hooking up with a lot of the younger females. I didn't know any of this until one of the airmen, she came and talked to me, saying, hey, there's this one guy. And he hooks up with all the women, and I, you know, she's like, I with him. She felt she was scared. She was scared because she's like, she knew she shouldn't have been fraternizing with him, but she got herself in that. But they weren't together anymore. But she saw that he kept doing that with other women and other females in the dorms. Um, I didn't know the person, so I didn't know the full situation, but I did get the information. I wanted to protect her for a, a moment because I knew where she was coming from understanding and letting her know she's like I just don't want anyone to get in trouble I don't want to get in trouble and I'm like yes but we can't have him keep doing something like that so do something um, still protecting each other so I what I could do is anonymous contact the first sergeant or um, who is in charge of those dorms and just let them know hey there is a master sergeant I think she did let me know the person's name or there is a sergeant there that's a dorm manager can you please check on them or just find out and seek on your own, do your own research, kind of investigation, see what's going on, because there was an anonymous airman who gave this information. So I love how she said just giving that tips of information of be willing to be letting your airman hear 
let's not be quick to judge and hear and understand, but also give that wisdom too. Because I did give the airman. I'm like, okay, you're not gonna. We're not gonna keep going on in this progression, right? And let's not hook up with other people that you know we're not supposed to be. The military has these regulations there for a reason, and they protect us. They protect the um, good order and discipline, as they say. But yes, that was really good. So thanks. That was a great question. Sorry, we morphed it, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for a few more. Oh, we'll come back to you. Sergeant Fulcarelli again. What is your recommendation on building that culture of not only safety for women, but uh, unacceptable behaviors without being called a B or emotional or any other name? So I would say start with you, right? So a lot of times um, when we have rumor mills that takes more than just the one person. So when someone comes to you to vent about a particular person and the way they're behaving, right? Don't egg it on, don't continue to like stamp it out right there, right? And so that, that way you're not um, uh, allowing that to fester, allowing that to spread. And if anything, it's like, you know, we, we all express ourselves in different ways. And sometimes you can be angry and cry. Sometimes you can be frustrated and cry. So, you know, and that just might be that person's way of expressing themselves, right? And so just like um, some like to shout, some like to throw things, right? Ne that behavior is not appropriate either, right? So I would say instead of letting things fester, stomp it out. Don't be that firewall. If you have an issue, let's take it up with that person and see, hey, you know, we also have to be able to maintain our own military bearing, right? So um, just like yelling and cussing and, you know, flipping out isn't okay. You know, we also have to figure out how to kind of keep our emotions in check. Does that make sense? But I would say don't perpetuate a rumor is how we can help change some of that stigma. So because women and males, most of the way we are is different, majority of it, you can see. It's not always, you know, we'll understand each other. I think also helping our male counterparts understand us a bit better can help with the culture. Um, I have to trust a little bit that my leadership, they understand and know, hey, women speak like this, feel like this, think like this sometimes, that way they're not being so quick to judge us so I, I can't judge on the man saying, oh man, they're always so hard and they're rude or they're just, whatever the stereotypes that we give males. Um, I think it's important that'll help with the culture and understanding women, but also for me, it's important to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. I get to know the person, they get to know me. Um, that way they understand if they know where I'm coming from and I get to see if someone else is acting out of line or we can get, so I have to make sure I have my emotional intelligence as well. Just as males, they have their emotional talent. Some can have a rage and really strong anger. and. Hopefully someone's coming alongside them, mentoring them, and not telling them. So I'm going to come alongside a, a woman, and if she sees me getting crazy, she'll kind of pull me to the side, hope me, and be like, hey, that was a little too crazy there. That was harsh. Um, but I think just that communication and being comfortable knowing yourself, your emotional intelligence, but also giving that education to whomever it is that you're working with. Because I notice that different leaderships do want different things sometimes. There are some leaderships I've had where they're like, they want uh, someone, a mother, uh, may I, may I, may I, may I, all the time. Then there's other leadership where they're like, make decisions. I don't want you to have to keep asking me for things. So you get to know your leadership and what that is, but definitely I think the culture is that is just educating our counterparts on that. It's a good question. That is such a good question. <laughs> I have just been, my mind has been, all the podcasts I listen to on like women's leadership and it's really difficult because I feel like I've been beating my head up against the wall for like five years, you know, trying to make a difference kind of in, in my agency because most of our leadership are men, even though everyone else is female. Go figure, right? So I, I really respect leadership in the end, male or female. Um, one thing that me and a couple of my colleagues have kind of started doing is we have supported each other. How do I put this? 
So say you're in a meeting or in some kind of setting where you know, there's a group of people, males and females, and you're, you're talking, and you get mansplained, maybe. Woman-splaining does exist too, don't get me wrong, guys, I get it. Well, what if your colleague were to stick up for you so it didn't seem like you were the person that was you know, taking offense to this? What if when you said your idea that got totally glazed over and someone, uh, someone else repeated it and it became their idea, you say, no, wait a second, I'm pretty sure she said that, right? Or so-and-so had a great idea, I think we should listen to her. So kind of actively supporting just in that moment really helps and just having that trust with your colleagues, female or male, you know, um, just little things like that. We are actually thinking, how can I support this person that's next to me? I see what just happened, and I'm not okay with that. Um, that's just such a good question. I'm going to be thinking about this forever. <laughs> I think too, um, being in a situation like that, if you can be, um, like you say, in the moment right when it happens. It's yeah. really hard sometimes, especially if you're the lowest ranking person in the room, um, which I was at one point, um, when you see, oh my gosh, you're tolerating this, but this is not okay. Uh, it just takes one person to say something. Um, because if you're uncomfortable or if the culture isn't what it should be, I guarantee you, if, you're fe if you or someone else is feeling that way, there's gonna be someone else in the room that's feeling the exact same way. And it is hard to say, hey, that's, this isn't right. But it's also a lot worse to sit and let, let that happen and not say something, so. And hopefully you can have coworkers or colleagues, you know, whatever, teammates that you know will support you, right? So they'll say, yeah, no, she's, she's right. Or, or, yeah. it, it'd yep. be nice yep. to have that. Mm -hmm. And so if you can build that, just kind of have that group that supports you and respect you and you respect them, rather than, you know, the leader who's like, I suffered so you have to suffer, or this cattiness or, or whatever you have going on because of competition. Um, yeah. Yeah. I want to re-attack re one more time. Um, I think really if we um, have respect at the foundation of our relationships with our coworkers, that really helps. And the best way to get that is to truly meet each other where we're at, right? And understand like where you're coming from. Like under, know the person beyond their last name. Like know them as, you know, as Dean, as Josh, as Jacqueline, right? And know you, your family, you know, a little closer, right? That beyond that intrusive leadership, but like a true friendship, right? So when these emotional flare-ups come, it's I'm not going to reduce you to a label, yes. right? And I think when we do that, because our family, 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 we have these outbursts, and we don't just sometimes, right? You might just throw your hand up, oh, there's, there she goes again, right? But there's grace for that, right? And it's not, it's okay, there she goes there, but there's still an underline of respect for that person that you are still gonna hear what it is that they're saying and try to like clear through the emotion behind it and okay, was there truly a point behind what it was that she was saying? So, yeah. Okay, we're gonna have one more question and then I'm gonna ask a question. All right, uh, Captain Hunter McKinney from the 97th IS. First, I just want to thank you all for being on the uh, panel and for answering what, for me, has been a pretty difficult question. So thank you for that and you know, being vulnerable there. Um, I guess I have two questions. Uh, the first is uh, we talked about some of the improvements with policy and culture that have been taking place um, over just my career, but also yours. And I want to know from the DOD side and also the civilian side, um, what are some of the improvements you've seen in policy and culture of your careers uh, that shows that we're going in the right direction? And what are some uh, maybe thoughts, ideas for policy or culture change that we need uh, to make even more improvements? And then my second question is just, is there a book or a podcast or movie that you wish one of your male supervisors had consumed and understood prior to your, your paths crossing? So I... While I think that uh, sometimes like the sapper trainings and the things like that, like we feel like it's, it's, we get it all the time, it's redundant and different things like that. Sexual assault is still happening, right? Um, I think what is an improvement is the, um, 
the reporting is, is rising, right? And so I think we've cracked the code a little bit there. Um, I think the intervention, we need to improve there a little bit more. It's easy to say what you would do, but when you're in the moment in the heat of, the, of it and you're in the thick of it and you're seeing something, you're like, ooh, that's a red dot, right? And everybody knows what a red dot is, right? But do you actually go, okay, well, <laughs> that's something that shouldn't be happening, right? I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, a, what just something that can go wrong really fast. I can fast forward and know that this person is going to end up crying at the bottom of their shower, right? Like, I, I have to intervene. But you're scared, and so you don't know, right? We all know what we're supposed to do because we've been trained it. You can recite it. You can shoot up your hand and you can answer, but can you actually act? That's the scariest part of the entire thing. And so I think if we can continue to push a culture of action, then um, we'll get leaps and bounds and we'll be able to care for each other as wingmen um, and not just be redu <laughs> reduced to a CBT or for our training. Um, so I think that's how we can improve just a tad bit more. Um, and then I love the book, um, oh my gosh. Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. I love that book, and it's nothing about necessarily female-focused at all, but it really talks about um, being candid is kind is one of the things that, that she talks about. She talks about sympathy versus em empathy and how to kind of um, navigate as a person, but I think it's, it's good as a leader, right? Um, I may not know what it is that you're going through, but I can see you as a person, I can see how it's affecting you, and I can empathize with you, and I can sit with you in this moment throughout this uh, ordeal that you're facing, right? And never having gone through it. So for a male, never been pregnant, never did this, never did that, right? You could still sit there with the person. And then that candid is kind. I think it's very difficult for um, males to supervise females, um, whether it's a hair, um, challenge, whether it's a attitude um, challenge, whether it's a man, are those the right color nails? And or is her makeup this or that? Like, it's difficult, right? And so oftentimes I'll get pulled on the, uh, on the um, shoulder saying, hey, can you talk to her about this or that? I mean, that's happened in my entire career. Um, and does this look right? And uh, so just be honest, like, hey, ma'am, I don't think, you know, let's look at this AFI. I don't think you're following this AFI. Or, hey, your, atti your attitude's coming off really sharp. Like, you're being, you know, um, dismissive. It, it, whatever that is, um, you don't need a third party in for that, right? Um, and again, if you have that respect for one another, you have that, that trust, you should be able to make those corrections without creating, like, this big sit-down feedback session. Um, throughout my career, I have still I have seen changes. Leadership, I will say, Offit is unique. Coming here, so I've been to many bases. Coming here, I really can see so far the leadership from my commanders that have been males and such that they genuinely seem to care and are enforcing and taking care into letting us know in the squadron that this matters to them. Such as, like she says, sexual harassment, things like that. Um, throughout my career, I did see that it's getting better because the culture is changing where it isn't always just about let's sexualize the females and, you know, do all these things like that. Um, coming in other bases, like I said, other bases, I think they still have quite a bit to grow in that area. But I will say off it so far from what I'm seeing, especially in a, in a flying squadron, it's, it's been getting better. We take care of each other, what I've seen. Especially I like with the heavies because there's enlisted and officers together. So it's not just like, oh, these are officers, those are enlisted. Yes, it still has a little bit of that, but we are all together, like working it together as one. And there are a lot more males in that squadron than there are females. Um, yeah, so I've just seen it getting better. But I will say there are some low key in the skeleton, some shady people <laughs> still there that it's like, hmm, OK, I can't just assume or what the case is. but. I do kind of just observe, watch, and talk, and see and get to know them on those. So I do think that there are some things. But I'm definitely in agreement with her with as far as the sexual harassment and all these CBTs that they give us. I do wish that they would give more examples, because when I hear the trends happening like in the dorms, 
there's some airmen that just don't get educated in the information that what is considered sexual harassment. Oh, they thought they were just being a friend. They genuinely thought that they were just being nice or doing something that was okay to them because especially when you're coming in from a different culture and environment outside of the military and now you're in the military and then you guys are in the dorms and all together, you don't have those skills and that mindset. So when I see these, every time I attend these SARC and things and I'm like, okay, but what's the real example of like, okay, you have these folks in the dorms and now you should say if someone says no one time, you respect that and honor that. But I'll be honest, sometimes respecting of honoring no, just one time or no thanks. Some people are like, oh no, are you sure you don't want it? Come on, it's here, it's just this. Sometimes it can be innocent and then it gets into some crazier things, of course, when they say all calls involved. So I think our um, education could be better on examples, real examples. Not I know these videos, sometimes you see them and they're cheesy, some of them. So I would I would like to hear when they say that they've got cases that happen in the dorms of these things, of incidents that happen, to actually probably, if the airmen are willing, to give some examples like what happened, what didn't you know, what did you know, and then just probably give some better insight of education on that. Um, reading, as far as there's so many, I would say it's Serve to Lead, I believe it's called. It's Serve to Lead, I don't remember who the author is, but it's a really good book that it puts us all in that mindset that we're not all just should be, I already know this, I'm here to serve already, I'm at this position, I'm in this ranking, it's what I say and that's it. You, we should be serving one another to actually get to know who our people is and what we're doing. Like, if I'm ex expecting my airmen to take care of business, yet I'm not even knowing how to do it myself or what that, I'm probably giving them unrealistic expectations. So I really like the way this book was served to lead and um, learning how to just take care of and serving and take care of my people better. Good question. You guys covered it all pretty much. I mean, great, great responses. I see a change. Um, things that would have happened on deployment 10 years ago would never fly nowadays. Um, and it's great knowing that you kind of have that support from your leadership. So that's one of the keys is that your leadership is listening um, and that you can go to them and tell them that these things are happening and that something is, will happen. Some action will be taken. Um, so. You know, not just spouting, oh, I support you, I support you, and then do nothing about it. Really important to do something about it. And just to underline, or kind of a point that, that you guys didn't bring up, is I think the key is this newer generation coming up, right? So there's, a, I don't know, there's a little story. So a forensic anthropologist, a man, is kind of known to harass women. Um, at conferences and the field, um, and it's unfortunate. It's an older, older man, and my generation kind of, kind of just dealt with it. We we're like, oh, it's just so and so. Just ignore him, right? Well, it took the younger generation of these graduate students who did experience his harassment and said, no, I'm not okay with this. And with the culture shift at the same time, it was like the perfect, I don't want to say perfect storm, but it was like the perfect mix of all these things of people are becoming more aware of this, people are doing things about them. I'm talking about like the Me Too movement, things like this. And you have a generation who's gonna be like, I'm not okay with this. And I wanna see you do something about it. So I'm gonna to go to his university, I'm gonna to go to his National Institute of Justice, I'm going to, that he has a grant through, I'm gonna go through all these different channels to make sure no one else has to experience this as me and some other women around me who have dealt with his harassment say, why didn't we do that, right? It's this new generation coming up and I just, I think it's fantastic that they are, that they're showing up for themselves or speaking up for themselves and now we have kind of this generation who's doing something to support them. It's really important. All right, I'm gonna ask one more question. It was a pre-canned question, but I like it. Um, 30 seconds each, okay? And then I'll close this out so that you guys can have them um, for your own questions. Uh, what piece of advice would you give to the next generation of female leaders? 30 seconds, go. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the self-care, definitely self-care. Get to know yourself, learn, grow, um, and also learn from others, honestly. Self-care. Yeah, self-care. Um, be bold, be humble, and um, be empathetic. Yeah, you took a lot of my, the, Sorry. <laughs> you have been taking a lot of my things. Um, 
Stop comparing yourself to others, social media, get off of it. <laughs> um, and be brash, be confident, be out there. Because if someone doesn't like it, that's fine, right? There, she's too much, right? We hear she's too much all the time. That's okay. You can be too much, all right? Love it. And don't be afraid to change the culture. Um, first of all, I, I have, oh, oh, you have you just use, I'll just yeah. use this one. <laughs> I'm just gonna thank all of you for being here today. That was wonderful. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, thanks for asking the hard questions and being a part of this. The panel's gonna stay around for another hour um, so that you can network and ask some questions that maybe you didn't get the opportunity to ask um, in this open forum. Thank you. Thank you so much to the three of you. Um, thank you for sharing your stories, your personal experiences, the hard questions. It's hard to be on a panel and be vulnerable to some of these questions and talk about um, some of the topics that came up. But um, things that I heard today, culture of change, culture of action, and taking care of yourself, taking care of your airmen. I can't thank you enough. This has been a true pleasure. Um, and I'll probably stick around too to ask a few questions. <laughs> thank you.